Dirty Birds, what's up? And welcome to another edition of Falcon's Final Whistle presented by Zaxby's. I'm your host, Will McFadden. I am joined by Taryn Wiggity Wiggity Wop oh, and the amazing <laughs> Amma Saban. Yep, I warned her beforehand. I told her, if I introduce great. you this way, are you going to make us restart it? She <laughs> said no. My face is turning red, though. The look on her face is definitely <laughs> worth it. Um, but Taryn, you are wearing a, a special shirt today. Do you want to? Not the Tiki Bar shirt. Yeah. Yeah, but the only reason I wore a bar shirt to work is because it's from Fort Myers Beach, and we just want to give like our thoughts and prayers and just positive vibes all around to those who had to endure Hurricane Milton. And then as we're going to Carolina this weekend, all those who are still dealing with the remnants of Hurricane Helene. Yeah. So I know my parents are down in Florida, and they're okay, thankfully, but it just stressful times, and like you want everyone everywhere to be safe. Really puts things in perspective. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Is it's kind of like moments like this, as you're preparing for a football game, that like pulls you out of that mm-hmm. week to week mindset, and you're just like, look, this is a game. At the end of the day, you know, like there are way more important things right. on the line. So yes, everybody, please stay safe. You know, the storm is thankfully passed for the most part, but there's a lot of work left to be done, done in these commu- communities. Yeah, so. Best of luck to everybody. Prayers to everybody. Um, but let's let's get to some football. So we've got um, a couple of injury updates from the week. I think the biggest thing Thursday as we we're recording this and the injury report just went out, mm-hmm. running back Bajan Robinson listed for the first time as a limited participant on Thursday with a hamstring injury. Uh, so that was kind of... It's new. Yeah, that, that was the new news on Thursday. Uh, a couple of you know, good developments though on Thursday. Matt Judon uh, was upgraded to a full participant. He's also been, he was limited Wednesday with a hamstring injury. And then D. Alford looks like he has progressed through the NFL's concussion protocol. And he was a full participant as well on Thursday. So, um, you know, the Panthers have a bunch of guys dinged up. I, I think I counted like seven starters for them were listed on the injury report, two of their starting offensive linemen. Mm-hmm. So the Falcons also have kind of Darnell Mooney, who's been limited. Um, and they've got, Nate Lamon, who came back, has started his 21-day practice Mm -hmm. window after getting designated to return on Monday. So he has been limited twice uh, so far this week. And Troy Anderson has been held out of practice twice. So there's a chance that you get Nate Lamon back for this game. I I would still maybe say that they probably don't play him on Sunday, but who knows at Mm -hmm. this point. Just generally, historically, I feel like when guys get activated from that 21-day window, it's very rare that you see them that next game (laughs) play. So we will see, but that would be big if they could get uh, at least one of those guys back. So before we get to the upcoming game against Carolina, because we're five games in, and I have no idea what the heck a quarter of a season is anymore in the NFL, it's an odd game schedule, and I'm not that good at math. So five feels like a quarter to me, I guess. Five, Um, 10, 15. Yeah, right. And you're too short. It's like 4.25, 4.25, right, would be exactly. like the... Exactly, that yeah, was my calculator. Would, like, literally be the <laughs> the thing. So I guess we should have, at the end of the first quarter against Tampa, just, like, pause the game, come in here, and, and then done this segment. But, you know, we... <laughs> More now you're getting we messed honest. up. We messed up. So, uh, anyway, we'll do it now. But, Amna, we'll start with you. What is something you think the Falcons have done well so far this season through five games? I'm going to quote a bunch of guys from the locker room in the last game. We didn't blink. That's, I think been the thing that they've done the best at I mean like they're they're leading the NFL in comebacks every game Taryn knows is a, a stressful end <laughs> as she's writing the the game recap every single game has been a one score game yeah so just in those moments of not being of not you know not giving up being resilient mm-hmm. like that's a lot of guys are saying like that's kind of what's forming their identity and and when you're able to build those moments and like build that character so early in the season I think that can really define how you continue especially like injuries are going to come things are going to happen when you know who you are early in the season that really matters and then just you know offensively they're able to do things a little bit better they had you know threw it 58 times and Dak said we got a chance to like get down the call sheet a little bit more we're not <laughs> <laughs> we're having more offensive plays and, and and that really showed in the last game yeah I think those are both great points especially kind of like the identity aspect right like we talk about momentum I think in games but there's momentum in a season as well and to kind of like start quickly and and build that belief in not only yourself as a player but in the collection of guys that you have that comprise the team uh, that that is meaningful so great points what about you Taryn? 
I had the never give up mentality written down also, but another thing that stood out to me is like the defense's ability to limit explosives mm. because you have a stat down here, and not to give away something you're going to say later, but the defense is 32nd and third down conversions, and obviously that is not good. <laughs> but you don't see that translate into like something very detrimental because yeah. they are stopping these massive plays. And I do think the way... Jimmy Lake today and Raheem Morris yesterday talked about improving the pass rush. It's just like they haven't had the ability to exactly execute that because they're more so playing the game that's given to them, which mm -hmm. means stopping those explosive because things have been so tight that like mm -hmm. you can't risk sending someone to take down the quarterback when you have to maintain everything behind them. Yeah. So I applaud that. They haven't given up any of 50 yards or further, and that's... That's a, that's a good thing. <laughs> no, like, oh, gosh, there it goes. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the design of the defense, yeah. right? It's it, the most efficient and dangerous way for offenses to move the football is through the air. So mm -hmm. this defense is first and foremost, I think, guarding against that. And you and I were looking at True Media today, and the Falcons have allowed the least amount of 20-yard uh, completions mm -hmm. in the league so far this season. On top of that, they dropped eight men into coverage. They've done that the third most times mm -hmm. of any team so far th this year. So, again, like that paints the picture for you. Yeah, we're talking about the pass rush, but they're almost intentionally protecting against the pass. And when you see some of the yards per reception numbers against Atlanta so far this season, like they're among the best in the league. It's clear that this is working, but again, it's game plan specific. Yeah. This upcoming game, it's going to be a little bit of a different challenge, so we'll see if that allows the pass rush to get going um, a little bit. But Taryn, we'll stick with you. When you think back on the first five games, which player comes to mind and why? Kirk Cousins. How can I not after last week? Like 509, was it him who mm -hmm. had 509? Passing yards is just insane. That's wild. Um, and I then saw 550 one... overall offense, right? Yeah. One like, team gosh. didn't didn't even have 509 passing yards on the season. I can't oh. remember who it is off the top of my head right now, but I, I saw that stat where it was literally Kirk Cousins had more than one whole team. Well, it's Kirk Cousins and Tom Brady, the only two quarterbacks in the Super Bowl era to throw for at least 250 yards in both the first half and second half. And it's just like... Tom Brady? I'm, who is that? I'm not familiar with. Some yeah, would call him the goat. He who should not be not. Oh, okay. <laughs> Some would call him that. I don't know. But it's complicated in the NFC South since he switched. <laughs> it is a little complicated, <laughs> I was like, yeah. Ah. But Kirk has just shown, especially recently, why he's here and why the Falcons were willing to dish out so much money. And it's just... He never gave up on himself because, yes, there were rough moments in the beginning of the season with the offense, but... If last Thursday is any indication of what this offense can do, there were still penalties that set things back. That it's mm -hmm. like, if you clean those up, 600, 700, <laughs> why not crack 1,000 yards? You're greedy, okay, Tara. I not. love this. <laughs> probably not. But, <laughs> Let's go. but like, think about it. You take away those penalties and any backward progress, and they maybe have another drive. Yeah. And it doesn't go into overtime. No, it's absolutely. A clean game from Atlanta on Thursday. I mean, and that would have been historic in terms of like NFL perspective, I yeah. think, uh, output. Amna, what about you? Who's the player that comes to mind? It was Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll go like defense is like a 1A, 1B, like Jesse Bates. Yeah. And I, I love like hearing coaches talk about him. Like today we just had uh, Jimmy Lake and, and Jerry Gray and they just raved about him. Like just everything that from his preparation to his knack for catching takeaways and Raheem said it like someone asked him about it this week and he goes he's amazing isn't he <laughs> <laughs> just like I love that um yeah so yeah Jesse Jesse's a guy and I feel like when you think about the big moments especially like in these tight games he's always coming up with a big stop like he had the fo two forced fumbles last game one you know it didn't lead to exactly what they needed but it still was crucial for them not to like kick a field goal and, yep. and and put up some more points so he's always coming up with those moments I think of the the pass breakup in the end zone over the Eagles like just he's there all the time in those big moments so Jesse is 1B for me yeah, it's, it's almost unfair at times as I feel like def great defensive plays are sometimes defined by what the offense then does with them. 
And Ooh, good point. And, and like that. <laughs> thank you. Bars. And I, yeah, like regardless of what the offense does with with a Jesse Bates turnover, like he is playing just so well. He's like picked right back up from where he ended the season last year. And it's just, it's so comforting, I think, to have a player of that caliber where you just know like, all right, the backs are against the wall a little bit, but like you've got the right mix of guys in there to make a play when that is happening. And they're they're not going to blink, as you said earlier. So that's, that's great. Um, I'm going to say Darnell Mooney. Uh, you know, I, I think you guys named the two obvious ones, but <sighs> sorry. When you no, it's it's great. When you look at um, a player like Darnell Mooney, or I on the other side of the ball, like I could say Mike Hughes falls into kind of that same category. These are guys who, in Mike Hughes's case, he was here last year, but he is still a relative newcomer, I think, to the Atlanta fan base. And then Darnell Mooney, obviously, as a free agent pickup uh, or yeah, signing this past off season, what he has done just with Kirk in such a limited time, like the chemistry they've developed. It was hilarious talking on Falcons Audible this week with with Shock and, and Arch, like two former quarterbacks. When I brought up Darnell Mooney catching that pass that Kirk threw kind of at the front part of the end zone in double coverage, maybe even triple coverage, they both kind of like almost broke character a little bit. And they were like, I don't know what he saw in that play. That was like <laughs> a little bit of a, you know, trust throw. And it was, it was hilarious just to kind of see them be like, that's almost like an ill-advised type of throw for a quarterback, but because of the player down there on the receiving end, you make the throw anyway. And and so Darnell Mooney keeps rewarding the faith of Kirk Cousins, and and he has been an awesome surprise, I think, so far. Uh, if Tori was here, she would say Caden Ellis. So just want to throw Caden Ellis' name out there <laughs> uh, in honor of Tori. Amna, what is one thing you'd like to see the Falcons improve over the next five games? Run defense. Yeah. For sure. Um Jimmy Lake was was kind of talking about that when he was asked about the pass rush. He said it, it starts on first and second down if we can eliminate the run, if we can limit the run. You know, so those things really matter. They're fourth most in um, rushing yards allowed. Like, you kind of got to clean that up. And obviously, like, they're defending the pass pretty well in those explosive plays, but you got to tighten it up up front. So I think that's probably what's most important. Like, yeah, last in sacks. Um, you know, bottom five and a lot of pressure stats. But when you can start with the run... That really matters. Yeah, and I think it's definitely going to matter on on Sunday again, and we'll we'll touch on Carolina here in a second. But when you like the Eagles were a game where even though the quarterbacks that the Falcons faced and Jalen Hurts is a great quarterback, you kind of looked at the Eagles offense and you were like Saquon Barkley. Here you've got Chuba Hubbard, so I'm curious to see how Atlanta's defense maybe shifts to again take care of the run, like you said, Taryn. What about you? I'm going to go back to the offensive penalties. Yeah, I just want them one. gone. All of them gone. Like these, this is a veteran offensive line. There shouldn't be multiple holding calls in a game or false starts. Like again, imagine if it's cleaned up, what it could be. So you shouldn't have to keep putting your offense in second and longs, even first and longs, because it's happening before the snap. And yeah, they they were able to overcome them, but they shouldn't have to. And at some point, they're not going to be able to. Yeah, the, it's penalties are the one thing that are kind of like in your control that also will just totally bite you in the butt. Yeah, and it's been impressive, honestly, the the way that Atlanta's offense has been able to overcome some of these penalties. But again, you you kind of can't keep playing with fire in that way and expect the same types of outcomes. So that's a, a great point as well. You guys kind of I think took the biggest one, so I'm going to go with a little bit of an obscure one that I don't know if anybody would would really maybe like point out as something the Falcons have done poorly so far, but it is something that I've just noticed. I, I need like fewer of these random turnovers, hmm. especially interceptions, but we've had a, a receiver slip where we've, we've had two tipped balls. Like I think when you're talking about kind of seeing what the ceiling of the offense can be, those are the penalties are the big one, but like just avoiding some of these random yeah. turnovers, I think would be a great next step for the offense. And again, none of these have really been Kirk's faults. I don't think there have been many that you would lay blame on anybody. They're just kind of fluky. Mm -hmm. But I'm hoping the flukiness is behind us and that as you move forward, especially against some of these uh, tougher opponents coming up, that you will be able to kind of more effectively keep these drives going. Today's episode of Falcons Final Whistle is brought to you by Zaxby's. And after a long game, when I'm tired and I need to refuel, I turn to Zaxby's. Their marinated, hand-breaded, fried-to-perfection chicken fingers, they hit the spot every time. Get yours with seasoned crinkle fries, a nice drink, and whichever of their 12 signature sauces you're feeling at the moment. But it always hits just right. So next time you need to refuel, go get yourself some Zaxby's. 
So let's go ahead and pivot and touch on the upcoming game against the Carolina Panthers and the Atlanta Falcons. The Panthers are 1-4. and four. They are coming off back-to-back losses. The Falcons, obviously, are coming off back-to-back wins. Um, it really does feel like a matchup that favors Atlanta in a lot of ways, but sometimes those can be the most dangerous ones, especially when you are coming off of a lot of like really high-energy wins in yeah. prime time at home in front of a crazy fan base. Um, so, Taryn, you know, what do you think the energy could be like on Sunday? I think back to the last time they were in Carolina, yep. and that one also seemed like a game that was heavily favored in the Falcons' favor. So, as you said, you never know yes. with all this momentum. <laughs> Throw out the records. Look, as an Alabama grad, <laughs> Vandy just happened. So You said it, not me. I know. I, uh, but um, I'm curious what the turnout's going to be because this is a 1-4 in four Panthers team. And it's a later Sunday game, so people yeah. can still Sunday fun day a bit and then bop on over. <laughs> I do have friends who are going to the game, so I don't know. I don't know how much the turnout's going to be. But what is a huge vibe change for the Falcons is they just came off of multiple primetime games in Mercedes-Benz where Kirk Cousins complimented the crowd massively each time. The man learned how to swag surf. Or tried to swag surf, swag and surf, swag yeah. and surf. Oh no, no, no! That's how that's what he called it. It's oh. not. That's how it's okay. Called. I don't. Know. You could have told me there was an surf. and in there, and I wouldn't know. Like, well, he's gonna hear a lot of sweet and Caroline on Sunday, so he better get used to that. Well, with the dad joke, but <laughs> <laughs> Kirk would say the exact same thing, right? So, and I would say Kirk with the dad joke. Who doesn't love a good dad joke? I think they're so fun. I do. They just kind of take me back for a second. <laughs> Anyways. The vibe at the Bank of America, I don't think it's going to rival what they've had recently, but it's going to really show on Sunday when they don't have the dirty bird's nest there cheering for them. They don't have swag surf playing to get Kirk going. Like They have to rely on themselves to bring their own energy, and that's what I'm really curious about. One of those things where it's like, yeah, the energy is coming down so hard. And it's also it could either Long be a, week. it could either it true is, yeah. exactly it could either be like a trap game or it could be a huge confidence builder yep. where you can kind of for lack of a better word like beat up on a weaker opponent and you can kind of gel in these moments where you weren't before have a game where you're not in like a one score match and and Please. yeah build that confidence a little bit more yeah no it, it does feel and I've seen from a lot of fans online kind of saying hey I'm so ready and I, I even talked to one in person I, I saw a, a friend in person it was crazy in the middle of the season you know spending <laughs> long hours here at the facility but he even brought up like I am I'm all in on this team I'm so excited for this team and if they win on Sunday in kind of a convincing fashion because Taryn you mentioned all the one score games Rightfully mm-hmm. so against some of the the league's best teams right out of the gate. But the Panthers have not been one of the league's best teams. And so I think if fans see this team kind of go out on the road in potentially like a little bit of a sleepier atmosphere than what we've seen recently, and they, they do just kind of start fast, make it a, a true business trip, and then get on the plane and come back home with the W, like then I really think fans will say, like, I've kind of seen all that I need to see. We've mm-hmm. seen them win low-scoring games. We've seen them go in a shootout with Tampa Bay and make all these game-winning drives. Like, now we've seen them kind of handle a biz- uh, handle their business in a game. I feel like this game is going to show whether the Falcons play to their opponent's level. Exactly. Like, they've, yep. as you said, they've been against some really great teams, and they've met, they've matched those teams. Are they going to match, or are they going to keep that higher level against the Panthers? I think that's incredibly well said. So, Amna, next question for you. Which part of this Panthers team has your attention? Chuba Hubbard. Yeah. We talked about the run defense. Like, this is your chance to, like, show that you can stop a guy who's had almost three straight games of 100-plus rushing yards. And, like, the way that the this coaching staff looks at him is, like, Bajon Robinson's a really elite guy, right? Like, he shows that on tape. And, like, Hubbard is a, a name that maybe not everyone in, like, a casual NFL fan will think of. But, like, he's putting up elite numbers, and mm-hmm. they realize that. So I think this is a really good test for that, like, stopping the run, <laughs> being able to to – to take that and and yeah, that's probably the the biggest thing for the Panthers. Yeah, I mean, you can tell like a lot of news was obviously made about Andy Dalton taking over for Bryce Young, but kind of that change also revived Chuba Hubbard. And when you look at, at uh, Carolina's offensive approach, I really do think that they are run first and foremost, and everything kind of plays off of that. And Chuba Hubbard is fourth right now in in rushing yards, so it's. 
It's going to be a tall task for Atlanta. One thing that I, I think gives me a little bit of confidence, though, and you mentioned kind of the, the overall rushing totals, but on a per-play basis, they're much better than kind of their per-game totals, which speaks to the third down conversions, getting off the field. It's a volume play for a lot of these other teams. But if you can create some of the negative plays, which we yeah, I'd like to see a little bit more of from Atlanta's defense, tackles for losses, sacks, things like that, I, I have a feeling that that this game on Sunday could go in Atlanta's favor. Especially since Hubbard is a guy that can really break away. His longest rush in back-to-back games was 38 yards. Yeah. Like, you got to be able to stop that. Yeah, and the, I mean, again, the Falcons have been pretty good at limiting a lot of these explosive plays, but at times their tackling has been a little bit suspect. They've given up some of these leaky yards that I know the coaching staff, you know, they really want to kind of limit that. So somebody who can break tackles, somebody who is explosive and can break off these long runs, yeah, that's going to be a, a bit more of a challenge. Something that's going to be a fun matchup that I forgot about coming into this week, but noticed when Jesse Bates answered a question about Andy Dalton, mm-hmm. he lit up. He's like, yep. that was my first quarterback. <laughs> oh. And I was like, oh yeah, they were they were teammates. After weeks of Justin Simmons being like, all right, let me tell you about Pat, let me tell you about mm-hmm. Derek Carr, now he's like, all right, Andy. He I literally smiled the moment Andy Dalton's name was said, and I was like, that's sweet. But he's probably going to try to intercept him. I would hope so. I would certainly I hope so. I mean, it's so. his job. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, Taryn, so I got a question in, in today's mailbag about the run game. And kind of, I think the actual Ooh. word used was in the doldrums, uh, which I... In the I, what In the doldrums, you know, kind of in the basement. What are the, the Falcons' oh, run a game? Doldrum. Yeah, doldrum. A doldrum? You've never heard of doldrum? No. Okay, interesting. Go Is read Phantom. Basement? Go read Phantom Tollbooth when we finish What's up Phantom this podcast. Tollbooth? God, I, we have so much to talk about after this. Um, but basically just like Atlanta's like run conundrum. game has taken a, a back seat. Yes. And what do they need to do to kind of get it going? So I'm curious, you know, what do you think the the Falcons need to do to get their run game going? And do you think on Sunday we will see kind of a pass-heavy approach again like we did against Tampa? Or do you think it'll be a little bit more balanced and even favor the run? I think it needs to be a more run heavy a game. more run heavy game because I think that'll give them like a confidence boost that they can have it. They just had a massive passing game that it's like, all right, time to show our chops in this regard. And if you're gonna do it, this seems like the perfect opportunity too. Like this is the time where they can prove every negative thing that has been said about them against a weaker opponent. You know, they've checked a bunch of boxes, and this is one of the ones that's missing is a run-heavy game. You're absolutely (sighs) right that this is a game where they can (laughs) where they can really try to get that done because we talk I talked about the the run defense for the Falcons being like giving up the fourth most. The Panthers give up the six most. Yep. So, like, we don't know what's going to happen with Bajon, but, like, Tyler's been huge. Yes. So, like, this this does feel like a game where they can really establish themselves in the backfield. It'll drain the clock, too. It will. Yeah, like, and I mean, that's, that's where another I, thing. This isn't a shootout. Right. I, and I think against, you know, on the one hand, you could say, look, if you're Carolina, yeah, you want to kind of control possession, which... Interestingly enough, like neither of these teams are very highly ranked in time of possession. So I'm curious just to see like how that all shakes out. <laughs> Who it's wants like, the ball? It's like second to last and like <laughs> fourth to last. But yeah, they they do have um Atlanta would probably be well served to speed this thing up, not like Carolina, get a big play, get in this game, feel like they've got a foothold to potentially knock off, you know, the division leader at this point. So mm-hmm. yeah, I think that Speeding this game up, relying on the run, and again, Carolina is, let me look at these numbers, they're allowing the most points per game, they're 29th in third down defense, and they're dead last in red zone defense. So those are some efficiency areas, those are key areas of this game that I think having a good run game should Mm -hmm. really help you in some of those, because, you know, an incomplete pass happens. Mm -hmm. But if you've got a a solid offensive line, which Atlanta does, you've got great running backs, I trust them on third and three to get four yards, right? So especially against this defense, and and let's see if they're going to be able to do it. That being said, I would be on the lookout for some explosive pass plays. I I kind of think that's the formula. That's where I'm back and forth because under the three things they have to do, one of them I have is just dominate. So now I'm also like, throw the ball. Get these massive explosive plays while you can. Get that confidence boost that you can put a game away by more than one touchdown. (laughs) And uh, yeah, but like, if you're running the clock by running the ball, you can't really do that. So I'm like back and forth. They're like, I want them to run the ball to prove that they can. But it's also like, put up the points. 
because you need a deciding win. So, yeah, oh. we're, we're going to now get to kind of the three things <laughs> jumped. that the Falcons you did. You jumped, but it's okay, honestly, because that, just, that just means you were excited to get to it, and exactly. we, led, we led into it I'm perfectly. Indecisive. So you're, one of your three things that the Falcons have to do to get a win on Sunday is just dominate. Mm-hmm. And you want to see them go out from start to finish, not play down to their competition. I, I think, again, that is maybe my favorite point of this whole podcast. Oh, it's just you. like the playing to the different levels. Mm-hmm. We've seen them play really good teams, and we've seen them rise to that occasion. Now, can you, again, on the road, kind of maintain that high level of play, even if there's not you know, somebody else pushing you in that way? So that's one of your three. Amna, what's one of your three? One of my three, well, we kind of talked about it before, but just don't get complacent. I don't think a, a slow start would be all that surprising, especially since they like haven't played in several days and it's just a different yeah. cadence and routine. But if you're finishing in like there's, you know, the Panthers are, say you develop a leave and the Panthers are coming back and you just barely scratch it out, that's to me a little bit complacent. Yeah, that's fair. Um, so one of my three, third down. Kind of talked about it offensively. Keep the ball rolling. Stay ahead of the chains. I think avoiding penalties is going to be huge in that area because the Falcons have been they've been gaining yardage at a pretty decent clip on a per play basis. It's just these negative plays that they keep imposing upon themselves. So getting third down both sides of the ball, get better on defense, get off the field with some of these negative plays, and then offensively just keep the momentum rolling. So Taryn, what's the second of your three? Ooh, pressure on Andy Dalton because like we were talking about before, they just haven't pressured quarterbacks enough. Five sacks through five games isn't enough. Yeah, I would love, honestly, if, if like nothing else happened, the way we saw the offense explode on Thursday night, if if everything else is kind of normal in a typical game and Kirk Cousins throws for 196 and one touchdown, and what if the pass rush has like four sacks in this game, I will still be feeling good even if it's a 17-10 to 10 win. Right? The Panthers so. have had two games where they've given up four sacks. There you go. So. Let's hope that's a third. Let's go for the trifecta. Um, no, what's your second one? My second one, you kind of mentioned just now, but uh, limiting penalties. Like, Taryn, you're totally right. The, the the amount of times that they put themselves in like a first and 20, and I was like, oh, okay, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But like, like, they were able to overcome that a little bit, but like, you're not setting your... If that becomes a trend, and it so far throughout the season has been, it's still, I would say, early. So you, you want to be able to tighten that up as much as possible. For sure. Um, My second is explosive plays. Mostly on offense, talked about the defense being good at limiting those explosive plays. Honestly, outside of Deontay Johnson, I don't really expect maybe Xavier Leggett, who I really loved as a rookie coming out uh, this past year, just really cool physical receiver, but um, I digress. (laughs) <laughs> I, I don't expect, you know, Carolina's offense to be the most explosive thing that we've ever seen, especially through the air, certainly not compared to some of these other teams that Atlanta's played. So offensively, can you run, run, mm-hmm. run, boom, haymaker to Darnell Mooney, Ray Ray McLeod, Kyle Pitts, like get the, I don't know if we need the volume. I don't need Kirk to throw the ball 58 <laughs> times or however many times he did, but just hit some of those explosive plays when you do decide to take your swings. Yeah. Third I'm and scratching mine out. And I'm because I had established the run, which I still believe, <laughs> but I want just more of a balance. I'll settle for a balance because I do like how you were saying, like, run, 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 boom, run, 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 boom. Yeah. Probably not exactly like that, but balanced balance. Offense. Okay. Balance, balance, balance. Amna, your third? My third was keep the takeaways coming. Yeah. There's been three straight games with takeaways, if I'm remembering correctly, but like four out of five of the games. They've had a takeaway. So, uh, Jesse, it's time to intercept your boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, three no, three straight is is uh, is right because we had that one against Kansas City as well um, that Pat threw on the Kansas Kansas City's first possession. So, yeah, that would be three straight, and let's make it a fourth. Again, I think turnovers have really, especially the late game turnovers, have been huge mm-hmm. for Atlanta starting this season. Three and two. Um, but getting one in the first quarter would also be really nice. <laughs> so my final one is handle Hubbard. I think, uh, like we said, Chuba Hubbard is the most dangerous part of Carolina's offense. It's no slight to Andy Dalton. <laughs> it's no slight to any of the other guys. But Catching strays. I would love to see uh, Chuba held under 100 yards again. And even, even if they let him maybe get his and shut everything else down, I think there is a path to victory for Atlanta through that. But again, if we're talking about just handle your business – get a dominant win, I think that starts by shutting down the other team's best player, the best plan of attack that they have, and showing, you know, answering some of those questions about the run defense as well. So 
Those are our uh, each of our three things that the Falcons have to do to win on Sunday. Before I wrap things up, anybody open floor? Got anything else to add? If you can donate to help Hurricane Efforts, do that. Oh, that's sweet. Thanks. Yeah, definitely. Please do that. Amna, anything else? No? I don't no. know how you follow that up. Forever hold <laughs> your no, keys. Honestly, yeah, like, we should, we should <laughs> leave it on that note because that is probably what's most important. For sure. Um, all right, cool. So that will do it for today's episode. Uh, remember... We've got kickoff, 425 on Sunday. You can watch the game on Fox. Um, But before kickoff, an hour before, go to the YouTube channel. We've got our Atlanta Falcons pregame show, which will begin streaming an hour before kickoff, so you guys don't have to wait Mm -hmm. to get in on all the Dirty Bird action uh, before the game. And then one other reminder, go download our app. If you don't have the Atlanta Falcons app, it is truly incredible, especially on game day. There's a whole kind of like customized game day look to it, but you can get uh, team news, you can get roster updates, player features sent right to your phone via push notifications, um, and there's a lot of other really, really cool stuff. So go check out the the app. It's essential on game day, honestly. So for Taryn Walk, for Omna Saban, I'm Will McFadden. Thank you guys so much for listening to Falcons Final Whistle presented by Zaxby's. We will see you all after the game.